So today's information module is about humanities thinking tools. And these tools are very effective for slowing thinking down and for examining beliefs and attitudes. So the humanities are a collection of subjects studied at the university, modern languages, uh, literature, philosophy, history, anthropology, politics, religion, and art among them. And uh, we're going to look in particular today at methods of thinking from the field of philosophy. We have already looked at abstracting as a method for thinking or tracking abstractions. And we've looked at it both in terms of thinking, what people do when they think, and interpretation. We used it to interpret Susan Glasspool's story, Trifles. Remember, we said that there are levels of abstraction. And when you are engaged in fast thinking, you go very quickly from the least abstract, just a specific instance of something, to a generalization that's in your mind. With slow thinking, you slow that process down, and that's what we're going to look at now. Looking at Susan Glasspool's trifles again, you can see the women characters engaged in slow thinking. They look at the erratic sewing on the quilt, and they gradually come to realize that it represents an emotional state and figure out why Mrs. Wright was in that emotional state. And then in interpreting the play, we looked at law and different kinds of law, women's law, men's law. So it was using abstraction as a way to think about the story we were reading, as a way to interpret it. When somebody says to you, you know, I get what you're saying, but can you give me a specific example? They're wanting you to move down in levels of abstraction. Alex Hajek, whose article I'm going to be talking about primarily today about ph philosophical tools for thinking, he says that philosophers see the word the in neon lights. And remember, in trifles, we saw the phrase, a sheriff's wife is married to the law. And we thought about it and thought, well, maybe the sheriff's wife is married to a different law than her husband is. What is the law? There are many kinds of law. And Hajek uses the example, do the right thing. This is something you might say to yourself when you're thinking or talking with a friend when you're getting their help thinking about what to do. Do the right thing. Well, the question Hajak asks, questions he asks, are, is there one right thing? And then, what do you mean by right? Right morally? Right rationally? So these are ways of thinking and interpreting. Another method is oppositions. So thinking about something, you might want to ask yourself, well, if this is true, it's true as opposed to what? And um, also in interpreting, when I read a text, I very often just make a chart while I'm reading something that's difficult to read and put categories headings on either side of a page with a line down the middle and start jotting down what this person says falls under these categories, these more abstract categories. So reading Botten, his Consolation of Philosophy, we might use the categories common sense as opposed to philosophy. Common sense is intuitive. Philosophy involves expertise. Common sense is popular. 
Philosophy involves being independent of public opinion. You can see he's opposing the two. He's arguing that philosophy is something we do to analyze common sense. Another thing we might do is look at counter instances. So for instance, disconfirming evidence. I see a lot of videos on TikTok showing all these really cute, sweet pit bulls. And they're trying to prove that pit bulls are not vicious, that the ones that are have been trained to be vicious or mistreated. Now, when scientists do experiments, they do have outliers sometimes to the group of results they have. And they do try to explain them away, but they aren't so very bothered by them. Philosophers, in contrast, are, if there is disconfirming evidence, then your claim is not logical. Counterexamples is another way of finding counter instances. So for instance, in Hajek's article, he says, take the idea that all events have a cause. Well, the Big Bang doesn't have a cause. And he says one good way of finding counterexamples is to look at the most extreme cases of something. This is why people talk about the Holocaust when trying to talk about human nature. It's a really extreme example of what human nature is capable of. Hajek says about counter instances, they're, they're a really good corrective to cognitive biases. To, so to some of the fast thinking that we've been looking at, they are good correctives to confirmation bi bias, which is the tendency to look just for, th for bits of evidence that confirm what you already know, and congruence bias. Uh, he says congruence bias is not adequately testing your hypotheses. So when you look for counter instances, you ask yourself, can I think of any case when this isn't true? And then what's that case like? Is that important to what I'm trying to think about here? And Hajek also says that racial stereotypes are very often confirmed through confirmation bias. In other words, for just looking for instances that confirm what you already believe. I remember driving in a cab and the cab driver saying to me that uh, a black cab driver had raped a woman. And I wanted to say to him, well, do white cab drivers, drivers ever do that? Um, because yeah, they do. So, um, he was seeing that instance as a confirmation of his racial, racial bias, when in fact, there are disconfirming bits of evidence as well. The other piece of philosophical thinking that Hajek discusses is analogical thinking. And it's using models you say X is like Y in order to understand it. So here is a quasi-realistic diagram of planets in the universe. And next to it, you see a, a model. It's a picture, but it really is a model of the atom. We can't see atoms, see inside them. Niels Bohr is the one who developed this theory of how atoms work with electrons and protons. And um, he used deliberately used the solar system as a model. So this image of the atom isn't a real representation. It's a model that's called the planetary model. Models are really useful for thinking. Analogical thinking is really helpful. So when you use an uh, Y as a model for X, you do so in order to understand it better. Now, metaphors are models built in words. For example, some of you mentioned that 
my metaphor in the lecture last week that abstract words are like big buckets was a very useful metaphor. I'm comparing abstract ideas to buckets that you can put things in. That's a metaphor. It's a model built in words. And we're going to be spending two uh, weeks of the semester studying metaphors. So what I've shown you here are tools for thinking. I'll just go back really quickly and summarize them. We've looked at abstracting, moving up and down levels of abstraction. We've looked at oppositions. What is opposed to what in this idea or text? We've looked at counter instances, disconfirming evidence and counter examples. And we are going, we have looked today and we are going to look more in during the semester at analogical thinking.